Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House and our Sunday morning service for December the 27th, 2020. Glad that you could be with us. For those who are visiting, uh, welcome for our regular attenders. I hope you've had a very Merry Christmas with your family and friends and uh, we're looking forward to the new year in a couple of days. Well, last week I, I had a message that revolved around Christmas but I'd like to return back to my series in uh, 1 Peter. So would you bow with me in prayer this morning before we begin? Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for every person that's uh, here today that's listening to this broadcast. Father, I, I just pray that you'd open the eyes of our heart to see the truth from your perspective. God, that you would guide me as I speak and that you would help the hearers to glean understanding and be encouraged in their walk of faith. And I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the world seems to be spiraling out of control in our day. It's no uh, secret. We've had a pandemic worldwide over the past year and a controversial election that's taken place south of us in the United States. Uh, it just seems like there's so much upheaval everywhere you look. The media is readily accessible uh, to everyone in the world almost, and it's a buffet of uh, philosophical stances or religious views uh, where you can pretty much pick from every kind of thought process that there is out there. Well, it's a different world than what we've been used to, and we realize that things... Uh, as they were, might never be as they were in the future again. Well, throughout the ages, the Church of Christ has suffered persecution. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about persecution this morning, um, Christian suffering for doing good, and also maybe for making bad decisions. The text this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 to 21. You see, many times the uh, church has been maligned for doing what is right. And um, we've seen also times where the church has behaved very badly and has been maligned for evil behavior. Um, when the church behaves badly, the way to freedom is clouded for those who desperately need to see salvation and life as God truly intended. So it's important for us to to do what is right. And if we're persecuted in that, um, that's, that's good because the Bible calls us blessed. How do we know the difference between persecution for good behavior or bad behavior? Well, we must rely upon the Word of God for illumination onto how we should carry ourselves. That way we can avoid any kind of false teaching or heresy that does harm to the gospel and uh, going forward effectively. So 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, 13 to 22, Simon Peter wants to teach us some, some doctrine about how to respond to suffering. So verse 13, we read, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. So we see in this, in the first two verses of our text, in suffering, Peter says that believers must not be afraid. He implies in verse 13 that most of the time, when we do what is good, no harm will come to us. But despite that rule of thumb, there's going to be times when believers do what is right and are persecuted for it. As a matter of fact, our enemy does not have any love for believers. The devil will attempt to influence people to resist our efforts at spreading the gospel effectively, and he'll try to hurt us. Now, most of us at one time or another in our lives have, have experienced the unseen recoiling or clashing that occurs when spiritual evil and good meat. It's true that those whose hearts are in love with the darkness and are at enmity with God 
they will also have enmity and revulsion in their hearts towards God's children who are filled with God's Holy Spirit. The result of this inward revulsion is often manifested in physical persecution. An ancient believing wise man once said that when a wicked man treated him nicely, what bad thing have I done that he should speak so well of me? No, my friends, we should not be at all surprised if we stand up for what is right and that some people have a revulsion for us and treat us badly when we do so. If we suffer for what is right, we are blessed. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 to 13, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Peter, who was persecuted terribly and eventually died a martyr's death, he was persecuted for righteousness' sake. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, was kept safe by God spiritually, even though he was harmed and died physically from his physical persecution. The Apostle Paul agrees with Peter in saying, in Romans 8, 35-39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Both Peter and Paul encourage the believers not to be dismayed when they suffer for doing what is right. True believers in the Lord Jesus do not need to be afraid of anything that man can do to them in the physical realm. I have said this before, that the true church of Christ is not an institution, it's not a building, it's the people who have been purchased by Christ, who have been cleansed from their sins by God's grace and who have been filled with God's Holy Spirit, sealing us for all of eternity to come. What can the man influenced by the principalities and powers of this dark world do to separate us from our eternal destiny? Absolutely nothing at all. We do not need to live in fear, my friends. We can live in confidence and say, if God is with us, who can be against us? Now amongst the people of God, sadly, we have seen so much anger venting against the system of this world. Now very often the anger is a manifestation of fear. Now people who do not want to be hurt will naturally do three things when confronted by a threat or a perception of a threat to their health or well-being. Depending on the personality, people will manifest fear response in one of three ways. They will either run away from the threat, they will hide from the threat, or they will fight the threat. In our passage today, Peter encourages believers not to fear the threats which rise up against us. For if you suffer at the hands of men who are influenced by evil, you are blessed by God. 2020 is nearly behind us and 2021 is in front of us. There is no guarantee that this new year is going to bring a pain-free existence for God's people. We should not at all be surprised if our physical circumstances actually get worse. Peter says to the church in verse 15, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. My fellow believers, rather than fearing the potential threats of those who are resisting the gospel, we ought to turn our eyes upon Jesus and recognize Jesus and his lordship over us, over our circumstances, and indeed over all of the ominous threatening possibilities 
that might be coming our way in 2021. Peter goes on to say in the second half of verse 15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. As Christians, we are not exempt from being tempted to give way to the compulsions of our sinful nature. In our sin nature, when we are confronted with the possibility of danger or threat, we may tempt to, be tempted to rise up and fight for what we believe in, for fear of losing our liberties, or maybe we will want to run away from the threat and hide out somewhere just to be silent and to be away from all people. In verse 15, Peter is encouraging the believers to step with what he said in verse 14. And that is not to be afraid of the suffering because we believe in Jesus. We do not need to be afraid of potential persecution and suffering for righteousness sake. Brothers and sisters, what bothered Peter and what bothers me as well as that many believers are not giving answers for the hope that they have in Christ. And many more are giving answers for their hope in Christ, but they're not doing so with gentleness and respect. Sadly, I see many believers are acting disrespectfully, harshly and brashly, or not saying anything at all. And they're doing this towards an unbelieving world when they perceive a threat against our way of living. This is not the way of Christ. And as such, believers that fall into this category are not truly acting in faith, but out of fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Peter addresses this and says we should expect to see resistance in our message. And we should be able to give a reason. We should be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. But it must be done in the spirit of love. Remember the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. It's all about relationships. It's all about love. The first two greatest commandments of the Lord. Love God. Love our neighbor. In suffering, believers are calling to willingly submit to Christ as Lord. Lay aside all fear of suffering for their beliefs in Christ and be ready to defend their hope in God with a spirit of love towards outsiders, even if such a defense is not warmly received. As believers, we're called to a higher standard than the world, a higher calling. We are called to be the salt in the decay around us, a light in the darkness shining forth the truth when everything else is shrouded in, in lies. Exemplifying unwavering trust in God, our pure devotion to Christ ought to result in us living righteously and treating others well because they are precious to God, and so also they ought to be precious to us. The gospel is the light of the world. It is God's desire to transform people from their lives of darkness in sin to living lives of faith and purity. The church is called to submit themselves to God and purity out of love for Him and to display that love and grace He gives by giving love and grace to others, just as it has been given to us by God. This means rescuing vulnerable people in their distress, in doing good to them, in practical ways, not just with our lips, with our words. My prayer for 2021 is that the North American believers, in particular, will stop acting as anarchists, revolutionaries, and rebels. My friends, this kind of behavior is not Christ-like. It is self-focused and self-centered. It is doing so much harm to Christian testimony and is needlessly turning people away from Christ. Now, there is some false teaching 
that's out there in the Christian church that I believe needs to be addressed, which may be at the root of some of the behaviors we're seeing. There is this thought process that suggests that because I'm a believer, I am an elect of God, and it matters very little what the non-elect do or think. It matters very little. Some people think that since non-believers are predestined fodder for hellfire, that they are pre-programmed to hate believers. As such, they've been predestined to, to hell. So why should the people of God really be all that concerned with offending their sensibilities? If they do not follow what the elect think, then they are acting out of their true nature anyways. If they come, it will not be because of Christians. It will be solely because God draws them with irresistible grace. Therefore, as believers, we need only be concerned with ourselves and our own meeting together, because after all is said and done, we are God's elect. When we offend the non-believers and other so-called Christians, and they stand against us, then we cry persecution. Oh, my friends, what a tragic and harmful way of thinking. What about John 3:16 and 17? What about 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 and 9, which states that God is will, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? What is the heart of God beating for? It's to see the lost saved. It is true and scriptural that God threatens to eternally punish those who do not repent. The Bible clearly states that the soul that sins shall die. But friends, this is why God loved the world so much that He sent His Son Jesus. 1 John 2.2 tells us that He, Jesus, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Man, if he is purely evil and totally depraved, he cannot repent without being chosen to receive grace and thus cannot truly repent. In thinking about things this way, think about this. The logical end of that thinking process is that God created people for hell and that man has nothing to say in the matter. I say that if this were true, God could not be just. And he would have to be the author of sin and of evil. And the truth is that man has to have a free choice. And God cannot be the author of evil. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 says, This message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. He cannot author evil. And he cannot be unjust. This being said, it's true that there is nothing that man can do by himself to get himself into heaven. Man needs God's grace and mercy, which only God can grant. God grants mercy to those he grants mercy to. And we can presume from Jesus' teachings that God will grant mercy to those whose hearts are truly seeking God and those who follow Jesus' path in heart, mind, and action. But nowhere in Scripture does it teach that Christians are to be the self-seeking elite of the world. I do not contest that God in His sovereign foreknowledge knows who will submit to Him and He created the universe in its present state with the true believer in mind. However, I don't believe that every aspect of predestination um, overarches to God predestining everything. For to do so would eliminate all choice. And without choice, it is impossible to have true love. The truth is that Jesus died for everybody, not just the elect. We need to be very concerned with how we behave in front of those who are not yet believers. God is patient with humanity not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And he desires that his church be ambassadors for the message of his gospel. My point is that if we buy into the false teaching I have described, we will consider ourselves as the elect of the world and will 
defy anyone who does not follow our ideas because it is inevitable that such people are predestined for destruction. So we need not be overly concerned with their state of being. Any government edict that does not follow our line of thinking will be rejected as propaganda of the devil and the system of Antichrist. And such it is to be resisted and rejected. We stand up for our dogma championed by a few preachers we subscribe to with their own agendas and are using scripture out of context to support their behaviors. Even when there is such a large body of evidence presented in context, the sound doctrine of Scripture presented to us is uniformly rejected because it does not fall in line with what our itching ears want to hear. Rather than heeding the teachings of Christ and His Apostles, we reject the scriptures such as Romans 13, 1 Peter chapter 3, and Titus 3 and follow men and their ideas. When we hold on to such positions, we will be resisted and maligned. It's inevitable. I would grant that it will come down looking as though we're being truly persecuted for the sake of Christ, but it is most assuredly not. When we are punished for holding on to something that is not scriptural, we are not walking in step with the Holy Spirit, nor are we being persecuted for righteousness' sake, but for flesh-driven rebellion against authority. And yes, I am referring to the believers out there who are insistent on defying the government orders for us to refrain from meeting at this time for the health, safety, and well-being of our countrymen. Therefore, when we act accordingly, we will not be blessed by God for doing right, but we will actually be playing into the devil's hand, causing division in the church and tarnishing our witness for the gospel of Christ. This is a most grievous evil as we become stumbling blocks for those who might otherwise receive the gospel message. All the way through this letter, Peter appeals to the churches telling them to do what is right in the midst of suffering and to do good to their neighbors. What is written here in 1 Peter 3 is still in context with what is written in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12-17, to which says, Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit to yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter does not want the believers to be harsh and brash with people as they give the reason for the hope they have. But also Peter encourages believers not to shrink back from giving their testimonies out of fear that they may suffer persecution. He wants believers to get, have, be ready to give a reason for the hope they have, springing from the fountain of their true relationship with Christ, with gentleness and respect. And he continues in verse 6 of our text saying, 16 of our text saying, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. In suffering, believers must maintain a clear conscience and endure it as part of the will of God. Doing good to our enemies, blessing those who curse us, praying for those who mistreat us, malign us, and falsely accuse us is, the path, is not the path of the natural man. 
This is the path of Jesus Christ. The path of the Spirit-filled and Spirit-led man. We may still suffer persecution from those influenced by the evil one. Even when we do what is right, just as Jesus himself was persecuted when he did what was right, as were the apostles and other saints of Christ over the ages. It is possible for us to be perfectly aligned with the will of God and still encounter suffering for the sake of righteousness. As a matter of fact, suffering for living in alignment with the gospel is to be expected. But in the midst of persecution, we are called to behave ourselves and carry ourselves with exemplary behavior, continuing to do good even when evil is done to us. When we bear up under the wrongful slander of men, remember that God is ultimately in control. Our good conduct, when good is returned with evil, will prove others wrong in their opinions about us, and it will make them ashamed for speaking against our godly lives. The light of truth always triumphs over the darkness of evil. Peter continues in verse 18 to 22 where he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. You see, in suffering, Peter explains that believers must remember Christ suffered for righteousness' sake as an example to us. In reflection of the suffering we must face as believers, Spurgeon once stated concerning this passage, it is almost as if the apostles said, you have none of you suffered when compared with him. Or at least he was the ark sufferer, the prince of sufferers, the emperor of the realm of agony. Lord paramount in sorrow. You know a little about grief, but you do not know much. The hem of grief's garment is all you will ever touch. But Christ wore it as his daily robe. We but sip the cup he drank to its bitterest dregs. We feel just a little of the warmth of Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. But he dwelt in the very midst of that fire. At the expense of his own comfort, Jesus Christ gave himself to redeem sinners from the prisons of hell. He exemplified a just person suffering for what is righteous. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit when the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection from the dead, signifying God's ultimately uh, in control over all things over all life. When we choose to follow Christ, we are brought over from death into life. We are disciples of Christ. We need not be afraid. For as believers, placing our faith in Christ as our Savior, our water baptism here on earth symbolically represents death to self and the ultimate victory Jesus gives us in the resurrection of our, of our being into new life. Our victorious Savior has done this. He's made the way for us. He's paved the way and He's gone ahead of us. For we were sentenced to death, but now by God's Holy Spirit, we too, like the author and finisher of our faith, will one day soon be raised with Jesus and live with Him eternally. Therefore, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not need to be afraid of death or the grave, nor do we need to be afraid from suffering doing good in this world. For Jesus has gone ahead of us to prepare the ground for everlasting life and we've been snatched out of the fire and are saved. So this morning, we have choices to make. Suffering will inevitably come. We don't know how 
That's going to happen. We will be persecuted for righteousness' sake when we stand up for what is right. 2021 might be a difficult year for the church. Maybe it's going to be a relief seeing what we've seen in 2020. But there is a possibility that we may experience great uh, suffering. And some of that might be from genuine persecution for us doing righteous things. But let us be careful how we live. And let us always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ with gentleness and respect. Loving other people and realizing that Christ died for them and desires that they would turn from their life of sin and turn to Him and repent of their wicked behaviors and come into a living, breathing relationship with the everlasting God. This is pleasing to Him. Now, in the age that we're in, my friends, we must be careful how we live. For our behaviors, both in person and online, are being watched by the general populace out there. And we do not want to be a stumbling block unto them. Some of them have never heard the gospel in full. And we don't want to be a barrier for them to come to Christ. So we need to watch how we live. We need to watch our life and doctrine closely and be careful that we do not get following dogma that comes from the minds of men. We need to hold true to the Scriptures. And what does the Scriptures teach? In response to what's happening in our community and around us, Christians, we need to be respectful. We need to respect the authority that God's placed over us, the governmental authorities, even if we don't like or don't agree with some of the things that they're doing or saying. We need to respect the fact that God has permitted them to rule over us and we need to submit ourselves to the legislation. I know what some of you guys are thinking out there that Freedom of assembly is part of the Christian right as far as the scripture is concerned. Well, I want you to know that that scripture in context is talking about people not failing to meet together because they have all kinds of other priorities in their lives that they are attending to rather than spending time with the people of God, edifying and building up and strengthening the people of God. You can still do that I would encourage you, pick up your phone, email someone, go on Skype with them, have a Bible study by Zoom. All these things are gifts that are given to us so that we can use them to encourage and uplift and build up one another all the while keeping our neighbors safe and keeping our testimony intact so that people understand that we love God. And we truly love them as well. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.